Okay, Dokily Boo Chickens. Awesome work. Awesome work. We're cruising. We're reaching cruising speed. So good work to all y'all who are keeping up and who are um, keeping on top of your videos. You gotta be watching your videos, my baboshkies. Okay, so last week we talked about, um, it was kind of like the same lecture, but I broke it in two parts. So last week was part one, and this is part two of the three stages of ceramics. So last week we talked about greenware, the first stage. We talked about the bisque firing, and when the pieces come out of the bisque firing, we call them bisqueware. So we talked for a minute about bisqueware. And today I'm going to talk about glazing and glazeware. So there are two firings, the bisque and the glaze. Greenware, then it's bisqueware, then it's glazeware. Okay, let's go. Um, so first thing I wanted to point out um, is like kind of going back to the health and safety video, which was showing you guys what our kilns look like. So when you walk outside in the kiln room, you'll see we have four of these Scut electric kilns. They look like this. I remind you guys, keep an eye out for these hot kiln signs, these hot pink signs. And if you see this, do not touch it. It's hot, even though it may not look hot. This one says it's 78 degrees, but I just put those on there um, because I don't want you to touch them. All right, so just trust me on it. Don't touch it if you see the hot kiln sign. So we got the four little electric guys, and we also have two of these big boy gas kilns. And these two different types of kilns do two different jobs. They are great for certain things. And the electric kilns are great for slow bisque um, cycles and low glaze firings. So they are slow and low. Think of these guys as like the low riders of kilns. Um, they fire slowly and they are great for lower temperature oxidation firings, meaning there's plenty of oxygen inside the kilns when they're firing. These big boys, these guile gas kilns, use natural gas to fire and they are great for hot and fast firings. So they are great for high temp um, glaze firings and they also have the ability to reduce um, in their atmosphere. And I'm gonna explain that later. So slow and low and hot and fast. And do not touch unless I ask you for some help in here, okay? All right, so um, we're gonna start with glazing. So after your piece, comes out of the bisque firing, it's called bisqueware, and we are gonna glaze it. Um, the reason why we're gonna glaze it is um, bisque, bisque fired clay is very dry and crusty and not great for drinking off of. You want like a nice smooth coating on the outside that's glossy and seals it um, real nicely. So there's uh, four ways you can apply glaze. You can brush it on, you can pour it over, um, you can dip it in a big um, big old bucket like this, or we also have a spray booth where you can spray it on like an airbrush style. All right, what is glaze? Glaze, like I said before, is that sealant or that coating, that glass-like coating on the outside of ceramics. It's the glossy white glaze on your toilet. It's the you know, the blue, pretty blue bowls and plates and dishes that you have. Like it's the, it's the glossy stuff on the tile, you know? Um, but what's interesting about glaze is um, what it's made up of. People are always kind of like, well, what is this glaze stuff made of? Well, there's definitely some glass involved because it's, it's shiny and glossy or glossy. Um, but if you were to just put glass on your bisqueware and then fire it in the kiln, it wouldn't stick to the clay body because glass tends to shrink, have more shrinkage and pop off. So we mix in a little bit of clay into that glass um, mixture to help kind of bind it to the actual clay body. And that's great, 
but clay doesn't really melt into glass that great. And so um, what people developed over, this is, I'm totally exaggerating, over um, shortening what I'm trying to explain to you guys. But um, uh, what they developed over thousands of years was flux. And it is sort of like another kind of like um, material similar to like feldspars or more, basically more racks. <laughs> and the flux um, helps um, perfectly melt together the glass and the clay. Um, and so back in the day, people used to use lead as a, as a flux to help make glazes um, melt better and stick better to pots. But then we found that was very dangerous because um, act, uh, we didn't realize till much later in history that the lead was leaching out of the glaze into people's food and giving them lead poisoning. Ruh -roh, that's not good. So a lot of times, mostly we use different types of feldspars, um, which is another part of granite and stuff. So anyway, so glaze is made of glass, clay, flux, and that's fine, but we also need to add a little color. And the colorants that we add in to glazes are oxides, things like iron, copper, chrome, cobalt, those kind of rare earth um, oxides, and they help give a piece of color. So here's an un, you know, a glazed bisque piece before it goes in the kiln. And see how it's like pink and red and white? And then here it is after it's fired. It's black and green and brown. And so it shows that here there's lots and lots of iron mixed into this um, glaze to make it black and then I'm not really sure but there's even more iron and who knows what else mixed in here to make this color and then this white glaze um, came out kind of like a yellow yeast um, glaze like a stoneware so a lot of times kids get confused when they go in the glaze room and they open up the bucket and it might say black but you see pink glaze and you're like how does that work and it's because there's a lot of um, these oxides in the um, glaze itself that it makes the color. All right, uh, back to our gal gas kiln. So this is a, a drawing of what the gal looks like on the inside, like a little cross section. And so underneath we have these little um, natural, um, kind of like natural gas, um, blowers that blow fire up into the kiln chamber, right? And so we turn on the kiln and um, gas like combusts and it makes, it creates heat very quickly. Like in the, old, in the electric kiln, we go up to 200 degrees and it might take two hours. This gets to 200 degrees in about 15 minutes or less, like five minutes even sometimes. It gets hot, quick, 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 fast, fast, fast. Um, and that's why it's important to bisque fire before we glaze, because if you were to glaze your greenware and put it in this kiln, it heats up so fast that that greenware just explodes immediately in um, this style of firing. And that's bad because if your piece explodes in this gas kiln and the glaze firing, it sticks to other people's stuff. And then you don't make friends in the studio when you do that. Um, people get bummed out. Anywho, so what I'm trying to show you guys in here is just the circulation of fire and gas kind of like circulates through the pots in the chamber when the door shut. This is a little side profile. And then it goes down, down, down. This is a downdraft style and comes up and out this little chimney and flue. And right here is something called the damper. It's a little door that you can open and close to essentially choke off the chimney. And I'm gonna talk about the importance of the damper in a minute. Let's get going. Um, important things that happen in the high fire glaze or the reduction glaze, I guess I should get into it now, um, is something we call reduction. Um, and in the previous firing in the bisque, there's lots and lots of oxygen in the chamber, in the actual kiln. But in this 
gas firing, we change the atmosphere of the kiln and we call that reduction. And a way of thinking about it is by reducing the amount of oxygen in the firing. Um, so it climbs very quickly up to 1600 degrees and then at around 1600 degrees or 1600 degrees, we start something called the body reduction. And that is when we go back. I take this little damper, this little door, and I start to close it off. So there's fire and fire and fire shooting into this inside the chamber here. And then it can't escape because the chimney essentially is choked. It's like, I can't get out. And what it does is it starts to grab um, the oxygen it needs, the fire needs from the bodies of the pots and actually the clay body of the pot. So that's what the body reduction does. Then we keep climbing, 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 and then we do another deep reduction at around 200, up to about 2370. So 2370 degrees. That's hot. Um, we're going to reduce the oxygen again in the kiln. And that's what makes the glazes do all these kind of pretty special, fancy um, things. So Reduction is when you're firing a gas kiln and you close the damper. You close the damper and you choke off the chimney to reduce the oxygen in the kiln. Hopefully um, that makes sense. But here's why it's interesting and exciting. Here is the same glaze fired in oxidation and fired in reduction. And so... The story behind these copper reds is red is like a really, really challenging color to make in ceramics. You can make brown easy, you can make blue and black. That's easy peasy because you just use iron. Um, and back in China, thousands of years ago, um, all the pots were green. They did all kinds of green because this is copper, like um, zen t um, zinc, tin, and copper. And um, zinc and tin make it opacified, but copper makes it green in this glaze. Here's the recipe. Um, and so the story goes that they were firing kilns and kilns and kilns of these green wares um, in oxidation, you know, just regular heat and fire going through the pots, and that was fine. And then what we think happened is an accident. Something must have happened. Like maybe there, um, somebody bumped something and it closed off the top of the chimney or the flue of the kiln. And in choking off the chimney, it reduced the oxygen inside the kiln load. And, um, and then later they were like, Steve, you blew it. You like fell asleep while you're firing the kiln and something went wrong. But then when they opened up the kiln, all those deep copper greens had turned this deep, like almost like bright red blood red. And it's a really beautiful color. I'm not a big fan of the color red, but in when a copper red comes out of the kiln perfectly, it is like magic. It's so deep and luscious and gorgeous. She's beautiful, okay? And it's rare and special. So that's why... Um, this reduction atmosphere just does really cool things with the glazes, and you're really lucky to have access to it here. Okay, we're almost done, team. Hold tight. Um, I want to talk about cones for a hot minute, about um, temperatures. Like, I've been talking about a lot of temperatures and stuff, and I was just going to try to explain what I'm saying about it. So... Um, in ceramics, we kind of have our own language. We, we like say these words and it's like you've never heard them before associated with anything else other than ceramics. But in ceramics, instead of saying temperatures, instead of saying, oh, we fired a 2370 or 1842 or whatever, um, in ceramics, we all just say cones. And so um, at the lowest temperature, our bisque fire temperature is cone 06. And... Cone 06 is the same whether it's in Celsius or Fahrenheit. It is like a known 
cone temperature around the world. And that's kind of nice having that standardization. Um, cone five is our mid fire or like kind of middle temperature um, glaze temperature that we also fire at CHS. We do that in oxidation in the electric kilns. It's kind of like our low mid temperature um, temperature thing. And then cone 10, that is our high fire, hot, 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 cone 10 reduction, the highest temperature um, that we fire. And the reason why they call them cones is because they look like little cones. They're little cutie guys. I wish this thing would go away. Oh, there it is. So you can see it down here in the corner. Um, these are actual little pyrometric cones, and they're designed to melt at specific temperatures. So when the kiln gets to a specific temperature, he melts over. And as I'm firing the cone 10 reduction, I'm watching those cones melt. I'm looking for them at specific temperatures in order to do the body reduction or the glaze reduction. It's cool stuff. Um, but before we had cones and before we had these high temperature thermometers called thermocouples, the way people could tell the temperature inside of a kiln was just by looking at the color of the fire. So that's what this is all about. So as we're bisque firing, the kiln will be dark. And then as it slowly starts to get dull red and dark red, it's about it's right around quartz inversion. And then cone 06 is right around here in this kind of red orange color. So they just knew they need to keep stoking the fire until they saw the specific red orange. And then they knew they were at the right temperature. It's super cool. Um, but when we're firing our cone 10 firings, which is cr really interesting, like as it's firing up, it gets hotter and hotter and hotter and goes past red orange up into the yellow orange, all the way up to almost like quite possibly white it's definitely pretty white hot. Like it's really hard for me to see in the kiln. I have to use welding goggles to put them on and look inside there because the interior of the kiln is so hot. It is like staring at the sun. <laughs> um, it's 2000 here. Like, you know, white hot is 2,372 degrees. She hot, 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 hot. That's cone 10. One time at my old job, there was a, a little kiln disaster where something fell over and the kiln just like took off and got really hot, way hotter than it was supposed to overnight. And when I came in the next morning, I peeked in the peephole, which I was expecting it to be like around here, but it was past white hot. It was past, it was up in brilliant white. Like it was the whitest, brightest light I've ever seen in my whole life in a kiln. And I was scared to death. Um, and what can happen when you fire a kiln way past cone 10, what's really interesting is it will literally melt the clay back down into like magma again. Like the pots themselves become liquid again. And so, yeah, that's what's kind of crazy. Like if you fire pots up past um, like up to almost 3000 degrees, they become molten. <laughs> so anywho, I find this stuff interesting, I guess. Nobody's watching right now, are you? <laughs> um, okay. And then stage three, your pot comes out of the kiln and it's beautiful, gorgeous glazeware. And it's gorgeous. This is all comb 10 reduction work. Um, that you can make and we have these glazes. They're beautiful. So I'm excited to Glaze your stuff. It's like one of my favorite um, parts of ceramics. Okay, last but not least, where do you put your stuff? Um, if you're at home, I'm gonna just have you bring it to school and drop it off and I'll make sure it gets in the kiln in the right place in the right time. But if you're in person, where do you put your greenware? If you want it to be bisque fired, you're gonna put it on the greenware shelf because it's greenware going into the bisque, right? So greenware, is the first stop it goes greenware shelf after it comes out of the bisque some little kiln elf kiln fairy is going to unload your piece and it will appear on the bisqueware shelf um the 
So your piece goes into the bisque as greenware and comes out of the bisque as bisqueware. So you can find your bisque on the bisqueware shelf. We got it. Um, this is inside the kiln, the kiln room. There's all these racks in here. I tend to have the greenware on the right and the bisqueware on the left, but always read what the shelf says before you just like stick it on there. Like take a minute and read. People just like stick it and then they stick it in the wrong shelf. And then um, if you were to stick your greenware on the bisqueware shelf, it would just sit there forever and ever and ever and not get fired. So you gotta make sure you put it on the greenware shelf first. And then after you pick it up off the bisqueware shelf and you glaze it, um, if you use cone five glaze, we're gonna put it on this cart that belongs here that's not there right now, but it will be. Um, or if you do cone 10 reduction, you're gonna put it on this shelf to go into the kiln. Then a kiln elf's gonna like put it in the kiln and fire it. And when it's all done, ski, she's finished, she's finished. They go here in the metal cage. This is where we can find them when they're done, done, done. Beautiful, beautiful work. Um, and if you put it on the wrong shelf, it'll end up on a reject shelf. Um, or I'll try and come find you if your piece gets rejected and talk about why it can be rejected. Um, it'll be rejected from the, from the shelf if it's unsafe to fire. Or if you put it on the wrong spot. Obviously, you need some reteaching. So um, don't get your feelings hurt if you get rejected. It's just an opportunity to learn. And if you can't find your piece, I charge a finder's fee. Um, you can't find it, and if I find it, then I'm gonna ask you for a little favor in return, some little tasks, some little projects, some little cleanup jobs. Okie dokie pokies, I hope I covered it all. Um, I will talk to you soon about other cool stuff. So have a good week.